Hello, everybody. You're very welcome. Good morning. Thanks for joining us for this WIMS live event about living a mentally healthy life in 2020, something I think we're all trying to do and probably finding increasingly diff diff difficult as this uh, unprecedented year rambles on <laughs> towards its inevitable conclusion. Uh, you're all very welcome and I've no doubt that you're going to get something positive out of this conversation this morning and enjoy it. Feel free to hashtag WIMS live on any of your social channels or to join the conversation with questions there. I'll introduce you first to our panelists. We're joined by the Medical Director of St. Patrick's Mental Health Services, Professor Paul Fearon. Hello to you, Paul. Hi, Dan. Um, Behavioural Specialist Presenter of the Behavioural Vaccine, Podrick Walsh. Hello, Podrick. Dan. And journalist, broadcaster, writer, and general rock of sense, Barbara Scully. Hi, <laughs> Barbara. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> so, we're going to talk a little bit, we're going to get a snapshot of where we are at at the moment in terms of where, you know, seven, eight, nine months into this pandemic at this stage. So we're going to have a snapshot of where we're at with that. We're going to talk a little bit about how we might be able to mind our mental health moving forward into what I think we can all agree is probably going to be a little bit of a long winter. Professor Fearon is going to talk a little bit then about mental health services and how they may have adapted throughout the pandemic some of the creative solutions that teams have come up with in order to continue delivering service to people that need them. And then we'll have a general wrap up on what lies ahead. Yes, we're actually going to get into the business of predicting in the most unpredictable year on record. We're going to try and do it. So we'll kick off. I'm going to start by asking you, Paul, what are some of the ways in which the general population's mental health has been impacted thus far in this pandemic? Thanks, Dan. I suppose the first thing to say is that we don't know the exact extent and, and detail of this. It's still, it doesn't feel like it at the moment, but it's still fairly early days in, in, in terms of what we know about people's mental health. But we do have a few clues. I mean, obviously the three answers to that are either it's made things better, which is very unlikely, uh, or it hasn't made any difference, which is less unlikely, but still unlikely, or else it's, it's, it's affected people's mental health. And we do have a thread of evidence um, to suggest that it is affecting people. First of all, we know um, from uh, a survey done in uh, Maynooth University a few months ago now, but still very valid, that when they did a, a snapshot, if you like, of the general population, they found that um, anywhere between one in five and one in four people were complaining of loneliness, uh, symptoms consistent with depression, anxiety, trauma, um, and you know high levels of insomnia. Now, they're always there to say, in the population the best of times but it gives us an indicator of the kind of things that um symptoms that that people are, are experiencing during this pandemic um, we also know that a lot of voluntary services for younger people for people um, suffering from thoughts of self-harm or even suicide and um, that they're getting an increased amount of referrals to their services um, we know that mental health reform has recently said that about when they did a survey, about 50% of, of, of adults who attend mental health services, so people already with a mental health uh, issue, um, have felt that the pandemic has either had a negative or a very negative effect on their mental health. So we, we know from a variety of sources that people are struggling out there. Um, the real questions are um, how we tackle it and um, uh, how we um, allow people to access services if they need them. Um, and those are the real challenges that lie ahead. Barbara, I'm interested if that resonates with you, what Paul was just saying, have you, either among yourself, your friends, your family, what changes have you noticed the most in people's general sort of form? <laughs> well, I suppose, um, yeah, one of the things that's very interesting when you're my age, um, which is late 50s, is that myself and my husband, before all of this madness uh, overtook us, we're kind of bemoaning the fact that we waited too long to kind of get started and get on the property ladder and we have a mortgage until we're <laughs> 70 and yada, yada, yada. Um, and that's become even more pronounced now. And when I meet with occasionally or speak with friends of my own age, that is something we're all, it's a real kind of odd one because at the one on the one hand, we've all been given at our age a taste of what retirement might be like <laughs> because a lot yes. of us have way less work than we would like to have going on. So we're getting this kind of like insight into retirement. Like myself, my husband always said, Oh, God, no, we don't ever want. He's a photographer. I'm a writer. No, no, we'll always be. He'll be taking photographs and I'll be writing. Maybe not as much as we have to at the moment, but, you know, we'll pair it back a little bit. But that's what we'll still be doing. And we're now going, actually, 
we're not bored. Do you know, there's lots of things we could do. The biggest problem is the feckin' money problem, you know, is the fact that if your business has been impacted, and a lot of people's businesses have been impacted to different degrees, um, that that's suddenly now you're, you're in a bit of a panic. And there's also then an underlying anger with like, we went through the recession in 2008. We managed to survive. We hung on by our fingernails. We turned it around. How the hell are we having to do this again, literally just 10 years later? Mm. So there's that. Then on the other side of it, there's the um, the fact that, again, a lot of my peers would be new grandparents. Um, mm. And so that has been impacted. In the early days of lockdown, obviously, lots of people couldn't see their grandchildren now and again this again connects back to the recession in 2008 when it was our children who left the country to um to find lives elsewhere in australia or canada or whatever and if a lot of those uh, young people settled in those places and they're now mm -hmm. having children um, and I have two grandchildren um in australia in perth um and my daughter emigrated in 2011 I have never since the day she left not known when I'll see her again. Uh, that was always part of the deal. You know, we say goodbye, but I know I'll see you in, you know, a year was always the longest. And when Emily was born, my three-year-old granddaughter, I said, no, no, I'm going to see her every six months. And I have my whole life. And it's only now that I realized how much of my life was set up to do that. We had a room. We have a, what was my daughter's spare room rented out to a third level student. That was my money for Australia. And it was very much part of my life that I, I got to see my granddaughter regularly. Obviously, that's no more. This is the longest I've gone without having seen her. And I've had a grandson who was born in June. I was meant to be there for the birth and I wasn't. And again, I'm only saying this because I know I'm only one of thousands. Um, and um, so they would be, I suppose, the, the negative, the biggest negative impact. Mm. And certainly things that I think everybody can identify with where whether they have the specifics of those situations going on or not, people are feeling a financial impact, people are feeling the absence of family and that real sense of loss that this has brought with it, people are definitely feeling it. Podrick, we all remember in that early phase of the pandemic how sort of glued together we were by this idea of we're all in this together, we've got this goal of flattening the curve, and then in recent weeks, that seems to have sort of shifted a little bit. You've got vocal opponents of mask wearing. You've got people arguing about should we go for herd immunity? Should we protect the economy over people? This kind of thing. And I'm just wondering, can you shed any light for us on why that's happened? Why we've sort of split? Yeah, it, it, this is the, I suppose it's the biggest behavioural intervention that we've ever had and we've ever experienced. And I've been trying to map the story of this collective experience that we've had onto something. And the best analogy I can have is, is a, a, a Dermot Bannon episode of Room to Improve. Now, not the, not the early series where we have, you know, it's just a building project. It was around season five or six where RT discovered that actually when we move the goalposts, when we have some drama, that is when people start to really watch the program. <laughs> and as a collective population, we're like that eager young couple who wants to start out and wants to renovate their house and has Dermot Bannon as their leader, okay? So we know that flattening the curve was that point where we got to flattening the house, really, you know, that excited point where everyone goes, yes, we have the plans. Derma has come in. He has given us that nice 3D drawing of what to expect. He said, there's going to be a three month building project and it's going to come in under budget. And we're going great. There was no moving goalposts at that point in time. Everyone's excited. There's a clear timeline and everyone is pulling together. And that's what we found around that April, March, April phase when we had this clear goal of flattening the curve. Ireland, out of 50 countries, ranked the highest in terms of collective buy-in to the measures that were being introduced. Over 90% of people in Ireland agreed with the, the measures that were being introduced. But we know that that's not going to get viewers, that on, on Room to Improve, where, the, where, where we really see things happening and the drama occurs, is when we start to see the builders speed up the process, where the builders go, oh, we're on time, let's speed up the process. Dermo goes on holidays and they can't find the plans and the messaging <laughs> starts to become a little bit unclear. And we start to see the couple get excited. So we had this phase around June, July, August, where we had 
the, the speeding up of the plans. We said things are okay. We're going to plan holidays. We're going to look forward to winter. We're going to move our weddings from May, June to October, November, and everything's going to be fine. It's just like the couple ordering the curtains and picking out the paint. And you have this summer response. But at the same time, we, could, we, we thought we could see an end in sight. Mm -hmm. And the goalposts started to move. And then we see, like, like any cantankerous county councillor or bad weather that comes in on a building plan or dodgy foundations, the virus is acting exactly like that. And what we have is, I suppose, the goalposts start to move. And that initial goal that we had has now shifted. And that end, end I suppose, end line that we had seen has moved. And that starts to impact on, I suppose, our tolerance levels. It impacts upon our behavior and you start to see the couple and the builders and Dermo have this, this conflict start to emerge where, where Dermot Bannon says we do one thing, the builders say another thing and the couple want to do something else. And do we move in or do we wait? Do we, do we continue on with Dermot's pet project in this or do we just change? And that's where we're starting to see different. We had cohesion at the start when we had a clear goal, when we had a, a, a timeline and a goalpost that we were aiming for. But when they start to shift, we start to see a shift in our own acceptance and our our own cohesion and collective uh, buy-in to this. So we started to see we start to see these conversations like you talked about there. Where do we do we wear masks? Do we go for lockdown? Do we have to consider other aspects of this, like the economic welfare of of and um, think about our mental health and other physical health? And these other goals and other considerations start to come into play. And meanwhile, while Dermot and 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 the builders are, are arguing over what they should do and what they should do, you you'll have you'll have this scene about three quarters of the way through the program where you have the mum with three kids in the car or you have the family stepping over boxes and you see them shattered. You see them worn down, chipping away, saying, can we just move in? Can people just give us a clear message or a timeline or a budget or some end goal in sight? I nearly move in before the house is painted. And you see this happening. And that starts to wear down on the resilience and the well-being of, of them. And that's where we're at at the moment. We're like that couple who are saying, is this going to be ready in time? Is, are the plans that were set initially the ones that we're still working off? Or are there a different set of plans? And this is where we see the cohesion of, of, of everyone pulling together. We see the collective messaging need to be really, really important. And we need to have, I suppose, a plan in place for that. And, that, that, and the fact that there, there's unpredictability around that is really chipping away at our resilience. And this week we saw the first disagreement between Dermo and the builders, we saw Nettle yeah. starting to, to disagree. And, and this, this is where we're at at the moment. And we're stuck in the middle trying to figure out what's, what's going on. Yeah, and you can really feel, certainly yesterday, you could feel the palpable anxiety in people that this sort of announcement had leaked on Sunday night about a recommendation to level five. Everyone panicked. And then the next day, we spent most of yesterday going, what's happening? What's happening? Somebody tell us. It was a very... Anyone you encountered yesterday, I think, was just in a space of, oh, my God, we're just, you know, up to the top with this. Um, Paul, I'm conscious that lack of predictability is going to persist through the winter. This is not a situation where predictability is necessarily going to come to the fore at any stage. And winter can be tough anyway on people's mental health. Oftentimes, people's mood might dip at that time. At this stage, we're going to have people burned out from a really long time of working from home, childcare at home, all the rest of it. People are, as Barbara mentioned, there's lack of stability around jobs and finances. So that's all gonna take its toll on people. Can you reassure people that it is still, sorry, I've just realized I've actually jumped ahead there. I, what I wanted to ask you was how before that we can prioritize our mental health, like what kind of practices you would advise that would help us to weather the winter effectively? Sure. Thanks very much, Dan. I mean, I think everything you said there is just so relevant, particularly as we face into the next few months. Um, I think there are a few things. Uh, first of all, I think it's important. It may sound very obvious to say, but it's OK to be anxious at the moment. <laughs> yeah. We, we don't know what's going to happen. And, and that's that's OK, too. Nobody really knows what's going to happen. It doesn't mean people are doing their best and, and that. It just means the nature of a pandemic is it's unpredictable. And, you know, strategies have to shift sometimes at a moment's notice. And this is this is just 
normal at the moment. Um, so it's okay to be anxious, you're not alone, you know. Second, um, I think the other guiding thing for me is there's a lot that we tend to concentrate as human beings on the things we can't control. Um, and there's so many things at the moment that we feel we can't control. We tend to neglect actually the many things that we that are under our control. And I'll just list a few of them because I think they mm. sort of a strategy. For example, we can control doing the basics well, uh, the, the hand washing, the hygiene, the social distancing, all of which are in the news at the moment. There's a bit of a split in, in, in certain sectors of society at the moment. But these are things we know if we just do them individually, it becomes the community. And if everybody does it, this is probably the single biggest weapon that we have under our control, both as individuals and as a society. Um, I think the other thing that's that's good is if we get anxious and uh, tend to start looking inward is actually to distract ourselves almost altruistically, instead of looking towards our own anxiety and how we're doing, look towards our friends and family and actually see how they're doing, ask them how they're doing and, and see what we can do to help them. That, first of all, deflects our own anxiety, it gives us something else to concentrate on. We're also doing something for our fellow human beings. Um, I think for people who, maybe who already have mental health difficulties, um, many of the strategies that you use in pre-COVID times are equally valid during COVID times. Uh, it's, it's, it's a stressful, anxiety-provoking period. So, you know, if you found strategies that work in the past when you're particularly anxious or when your mood shifts that work for you, they're still going to work during COVID times. You may have to do them a bit more regularly, but it's worth revisiting what strategies you as an individual have used before. Mm. Another thing is often when anxiety somewhat overwhelms you is just to stop, and I do it just for a couple of minutes each evening, just stop and do a reality check, just look at things logically, and even sort of question or interrogate yourself. If you're worried about catching COVID, for example, just look through the last 24 hours. Okay, well, how do you get COVID? You're too close to somebody, you're with them for more than 15 minutes, you're not wearing a mask, or you're not washing your hands or sneezing properly. If you then ask yourself, have I done all these things? Well, then the likelihood is of me picking up COVID objectively is very low. So things that you're worried about, actually ask yourself, almost like you're an opposing counsel in, in, in a courtroom. And, and these things can actually help, and it grounds you. Um, and the things again these are things that are uh, you know so important even regardless of uh, the state of, of the world in covid is the basics and um, the routine of diet exercise sleep and um, these we know these are good for us we know the, the importance of a healthy diet we know the importance of taking regular exercise that doesn't have to be for a gym for two hours every day it can be a half an hour 40 minute walk three times a week um, meditation, if it works for you, can be very powerful as well. These are things that all are under our control. And the final thing I'd mention, everybody mentions it, but I think we all need to do it, is to ration our news uh, feed uh, in our heads. Um, the, the one question I asked to look at the news a lot, the figures every day, the, what's going on, and look for, at the live updates is, is looking at the more actually helping you through this, or is it doing the opposite? And for most people, it's the opposite. I just look at the news for five minutes every morning. I might look for, at it briefly at lunchtime, the headlines, and for five minutes before the, and then I actually ban myself from it for the rest of the day and get on with the other things that I'd be doing normally. So I think, you know, I know that's a longish list, but it just sort of illustrates there are a lot of things in our control. When we have a sense of control, that makes us feel better in ourselves and it puts us more in the driving seat. If we concentrate on the stuff that's without our control, then it leads to a sense of powerlessness. So, um, mm -hmm. Those are the things that I use and that I recommend to people. And, and they... Yeah, I think it's such an important point you made at the outset as well, that it's fine to be anxious. Like the object of this exercise isn't to immunize ourselves against the natural anxiety that we would feel in a situation like this. It's to manage it, to cope with it, to kind of ride the wave to the end. So, yeah, it's, yeah, it's very useful to remind ourselves of that too. Mm -hmm. Barbara, I'm just wondering, have you thought about ways that you might keep your mood from dipping over the next few months? Have you dared to think about the winter? Uh, yeah, I mean, yes, obviously I have. And actually, just to come back to, to one thing that Paul mentioned there about limiting your um, exposure to news and all the rest of it, mm -hmm. which, although I don't want everybody to turn off their radios altogether, um, <laughs> I, I agree, I suppose, with that. I mean, last night I went to look for, I turned on the TV to dip into Claire Byrne Live as I knew Leo Varadkar was on. And there was one of those, coming back to what Porrick said, one of those big house renovation projects. And I was like, where's Claire Byrne Live? And I didn't 
get the it didn't get the message about that it had moved forward but actually i was kind of thinking you know what the universe has done me a great favor i'll probably sleep better <laughs> not having seen it so i think that's important but i think the other problem that we have is that because we're not doing anything we're not going anywhere we're not making any plans there's flipping nothing else to talk about i mean you know when you do meet up with a friend you're kind of going can we not mention coronavirus and covid19 and everybody looks at each other and going what else is happening? <laughs> Nothing. Anyway, but be that as it may, I mean, one of the things that, again, I suppose we learned during the first lockdown, um, and I mean, initially when lockdown was announced, I have to admit, being such an idiot, I thought it was going to be a reasonably short term kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And it was like, do you remember during the winter two years ago when we had the big snow? Yeah. And do you remember when, like, the government, all the the oh God, forgive me, all the boys, you know, were delighted to have an emergency to deal with so that they didn't have to deal with the stuff they should be dealing with. And there was the red alert and we were all told not to go out and to stay at home. And I was like, this is brilliant. We're all being given permission to stay at home, light the fire, drink hot chocolate, do nothing, not go to work. That's great. And I kind of thought that the initial phase of lockdown was a bit like that. Um, and then, so now, so there were certain things that I was like, this is great. We could do a whole load of jobs, none of which we did. But I think, again, to come back to the kind of positives that we learned from the first time and that I've actually stayed, and I hope we'll stay beyond this whole nightmare we're living through, um, is the emphasis on um, getting outdoors, which was easier in springtime, getting outdoors, spending time outside, I got a bike, I started cycling, and it's the best thing I have done. It'll be the, the brilliant, the best gift that coronavirus has given me uh, because I kind of got used to cycling when there was absolutely no traffic on the roads. And it gave me a sense of freedom at a time when I felt very locked down. So mm. that was great. But I also think the natural world is a huge help during all of this because when all our lives, as, as somebody said, are out of control, we have no control over them. Um, and everything is different. Nothing is as it was. When you spend time and you get out into nature, you realize that nature doesn't give a rat's ass about the coronavirus. Nothing <laughs> has impacted what nature's doing. Everything, you know, in the springtime, the birds were still building their nests and everything was going on as normal. And there is a great comfort in that. And it's like when there's a bereavement, if you lose somebody close to you and you are in the depths of grief, I always remember watching life going around and, and kind of wondering how can people still be going on with their lives when I'm in the middle of this awfulness and nature is a bit like that now that nature is still carrying on so and even I mean I live in deep in the, the suburbs but there is we're lucky in that we still have although for how long I don't know we still have pockets of parks and places you can go and watch the birds and listen to the birds and look at squirrels and I've never noticed so much nature as I have in the last few months and that's brilliant and on a related thing and actually straight in my eye line here as we're talking about stress there's a cat curled up on an armchair quite happily and I find that our animals also our, our pets have have you know taken on a new importance in our lives because they don't care either about coronavirus mm. means absolutely nothing to them um, and the other thing which is a purely female thing um, is that because we're not going out in the world as much, we let our hair go grey, many of us. We have decided to pare down the makeup. We have decided that wearing high shoes is a complete pain in the ass that you don't actually have to do. And I fervently hope that when things return to some kind of normal, that women will realise we have the freedom of choice about how we look or how we have to prepare ourselves uh, for the world outside. Because there's freedom in saying, you know what? I'm not doing that anymore. It takes up too much time. That in itself is a stress. So there have been a load of positives that I hope will remain. Uh, I don't think I've answered your question, but anyway, I, that I hope will no. remain after <laughs> coronavirus has gone. Um, and it's those kind of things that I think we will cling to as we go into the winter. So, and I mean, we were only talking about it here um, uh, the other day, you know, because I live with teen, well, they're not teenagers, they're young adults at college. And I was saying, you know, although the, the days are getting shorter, the weather is going to deteriorate, there'll be an awful lot more rain, the opportunity to go for a walk or go for a cycle, the, those opportunities will reduce. But it's really important that we maybe do them first thing in the morning when we can get out and we keep it up because they play a huge part in trying to stay a little bit sane. Mm, absolutely. Um, 
yeah, I mean, I think you did answer my question because yeah. certainly all those things you mentioned, I think you can carry through to the winter and will help you come out the other side. Um, Podrick, you mentioned earlier about in the context of flattening the curve, this idea of like the value of goal setting. And I'm wondering, is goal setting in the winter something that might make it a bit easier? Or is there a kind of a tyranny around goal setting that can just mean you're setting yourself up for failure? I, I think I think the uh, the devil is in the detail and it's it's what that goal is and how you frame it, because uh, I, I guess I, I, I listening to to Barbara, I, I go to a barber every once in a while and we usually have a conversation about gigs or weddings or holidays. And the last conversation that I had with the barber was very, very sparse on yeah. <laughs> very little to talk about. Um, and and I think we're all in that collectively together. But goal setting, particularly coming into the winter, I, I think is, is something that's important, but how we frame those goals will be different this time around. And Paul mentioned about things being controllable versus uncontrollable. And when we're setting a goal, we often fall into this really seductive, I suppose, uh, it's very seductive to think about outcome goals, that I am going to, you know, be a certain weight, or I am going to have achieved this particular thing, or I am going to, you know, achieve something that is outcome based but unfortunately there are so many uncontrollables this winter that our goals would be better framed if they're process goals that if we commit to particular routines we commit to particular self-care routines or we commit to doing something that is good for ourselves or for others rather than thinking about the outcome that we focus in on that process and for fear of sounding like Jim Gavin, the Dublin manager, you're just focusing in on that process, that I am going to do this thing and I'm not going to worry about the outcome for this. I'm going to go through this process. Another thing to tune into when you're looking at your goals and choosing that is, is this goal putting pressure on me or is this goal taking pressure off me? Is this something that is having benefit for me right now? Not looking into the future that, that it's going, it's putting pressure on me when already there are so many other extraneous pressures upon me. But is this something that is contributing to my self-care that is going to take pressure off me and is going to, to boost my, my well-being? Actually, go, coming into winter, I find intriguing. I am obsessed with the solstice, with the equinox, with the times of day, very similar to what Barbara was talking about. I have found nature to be really grounding over the last six months, um, to the point that we got a puppy three weeks ago and it is bright <gasps> every day, no end. Molly the Collie, all the way from my colony in Galway, she's a wee rescue dog, who is making my heart burst like never before. But when we're thinking about this going into winter, I don't know if anyone else had this routine when they were working from home, but we were trying to set up our environment. One space is for work and one space is for living in and being in. And sometimes we didn't succeed in that. Um, I found that going for a walk at five or six o'clock in the evening was a nice way to punctuate. That is the end of the work day. Now I'm into chill out time. Now, when we kick into winter, it's going to be more difficult to do that because we're going to be spending more time indoors in our home and those lines may become blurred. We did, a, myself and Kate in the Behavioural Vaccine podcast did a really interesting one last week where we took two different Scandinavian approaches to winter. One was the Danish approach called Hugge, which sets up your environment with candles and soft furnishings and board games and really low arousal environment that signals to your body that now it's time to relax. And that we talked about Hugue in the context of that, that our well-being can be maintained by this, particularly when we are working from home, that we turn off the lights, light the candles, and that is a signal, that is a, a trigger for us to start thinking about relaxing and finishing work. The other approach uh, is a more Norwegian. You know, Norwegians are Vikings and they like a bit more of the outdoors, <laughs> similar to what Barbara was talking about. And it's called free Luslif. And it links into this Norwegian philosophy that there is no such thing as bad weather just bad <laughs> and this idea that we can embrace the outdoors still there is still beauty to be seen in autumn and winter with the changing of the seasons but we need to get outside and my biggest trigger for getting good gear is the middle aisle of little that is my like <laughs> antecedent to say <laughs> I need to get this. 
I'll walk down and say, ah, time to go hiking, time to go biking. So really tune into those two aspects of it, that we can combine our cozy environment. And that needs to signal for us that I, this is time for me to relax. And it was an office from nine to five, but now it is my home and now it is time to relax. And then also tuning into this idea that there isn't, there's no such thing as bad weather, just yeah. bad gear. Um, and, and our environment is going to have a huge role to play, I think, in, in helping us set our goals and building those routines that are going to help keep us sane over the next while. Yeah, it's very true. Hiking, biking and go Viking is what that sounds like to me. But yeah, <laughs> makes, makes sense. Um, I just want to focus before actually we do that, just if anybody does have a question that's here with us, there's a little Q&A box. And if you put your question in that, that's the best way for us to see it, if you have any questions to ask. Um, I just want to move on to talking a little bit about mental health difficulties at this time and accessing services and that whole space, um, which is very important because obviously there's only so much maintenance of mental health that people can do. Sometimes people need real professional help and need to engage with those services. And I know we touched on it earlier, how it's been a tough year and how people... Also, I think a lot of people that have been working from home and spending time from home have had to confront some stuff that maybe their ordinarily busy lives have allowed them to suppress and these things are kind of bubbling up and they may need some help. And I was wondering, Paul, if you could maybe reassure people that it is still very safe to engage with services and maybe give us an idea of what those first steps of seeking help might look like. Sorry, Paul, you're just mute there for a moment. Just bear with me one sec. I'm not sure I can actually unmute can you. Can hear me now? You. There we go. Ah, great. Super. Sorry. I, I muted myself. No, you're fine. <laughs> Don't mute it. Um, I, I, I think, I mean, it's a very important question. Um, uh, and I'd like to reassure people that it is safe to engage. Um, uh, one of the worries that we have as health professionals, regardless of our discipline, is that there may be a lot of people there who are at home afraid to engage with services for all sorts of reasons and that um and that their condition whether it's a physical health or a mental health condition might be deteriorating so i'd really encourage people to do what they normally do and the first step usually is um if they've got um a, a problem that they feel needs escalation is to contact their gp gps are still functioning it may be by the by the phone rather than in person but that's usually sufficient to allow a decision to be made as to what where to go further in, in terms of and I'll talk specifically, I suppose, about mental health. Um, I'll talk about our service, although I'm, I'm sure it's the same in most other services, because that's the one I would have most. So if we receive a referral from a GP, what we would do is we would uh, get the information from the GP that we need uh, and to make a decision. We contact the person, that the, the, serv the, the potential service user themselves, um, uh, one of our clinical staff in, the, um, uh, in our admissions office, and would uh, get a little bit more information, then discuss with them about the best approach. It could be outpatients, it could be attending a day service, or it could be coming in to, as a physical inpatient, or indeed um, uh, a home care uh, service, which I'm happy to talk about later. Um, if somebody is coming in as a physical inpatient, again, like most other services now, we we've now have six months of experience of living with COVID in health services. Um, we do uh, symptom checks 24 hours before and on the point of admission. We also do a COVID swab um, and we get that result back um, usually within uh, 24, 36 hours. So not only the person coming in, but all the, also um, people who are already in patients have that reassurance that, you know, there's, there's a gate there um, in terms of COVID. Um, and, you know, our service at the moment is, is running pretty much the way it would be in any other, other year um, in terms of busyness. The only difference is that about a fifth of our inpatients we're treating at home at the moment uh, for various reasons. I was wondering as well, you know, I'm sure the pandemic has and the restrictions associated with it have presented some challenges in terms of adapting treatments and adapting therapeutic interventions. Yeah. I mean, I was thinking about something like the treatment for, say, social anxiety might involve yeah. opening up your world, making it a bit bigger. But now, yeah. unfortunately, we have to cut our contacts and make it smaller. Yeah. What kinds of creative solutions have you had to come up with yeah. to deal with so those things? I mean, ourselves and other services had to think really carefully and quite quickly about how we'd continue um, providing 
uh, help uh, to as many people as possible, particularly this time. And so again, um, as you know, a lot of services are providing telehealth or um, uh, technologically mediated interventions, as we call them. Um, what we've done uh, with our services in order to keep people engaged and connected with us, um, most of our outpatients we do um, uh, remotely. Um, of course, we still have the capacity to see people, but we do it in a much more socially distant way, in a, a less uh, socially dense way. Um, day services are almost totally um, uh, done remotely and they've these have worked surprisingly well we had to sort of uh, get them up and running um, without really knowing how people would take them but the surprising thing is the vast majority of people um, have taken them really well and we're beginning to suspect that that's not just because of COVID you know and that people are glad to have anything I, I think it's a bit more than that perhaps the most radical thing we did because we realized that there might be a significant proportion of people who no, normally would have been physically admitted to hospital, but for various reasons might be reluctant or whatever. And so we, we set up what we call a home care service, which essentially was there to replicate the um, uh, uh, what would happen as a physical inpatient, but done uh, from the, uh, in the patient's own home. So, uh, for example, if, if you're deemed clinically suitable for the home care service, we will contact you. We, we will do our ward rounds with you remotely. We we'll do our multidisciplinary team meetings. If you need psychological interventions, we will book your appointments as we do, would if you're physically present. And um, there are groups. And um, we will, if we change your medication, we uh, fax it to your pharmacy, your local pharmacy. Um, and um, again, as I said, about about 50 at any one time and often more people are on the home care service. And again, it's a good alternative to coming into hospital for people who are clinically suitable. And again, the feedback so far has been very positive. Um, so, I mean, there, there, are whole, there are a whole range of innovations that services uh, have done and because the, the bottom line is that we want to keep open. We want to keep helping people, particularly at this point. It's, it's a core service, mental health uh, in this pandemic. Sometimes people neglect that, um, but there's a real mental health angle to this whole pandemic, which needs to be, which needs to be addressed. Absolutely. And I think, you know, we're all we've all become acutely aware if we weren't already that we have an overstretched health system and we have had for some time. Yeah. And I'm wondering, you know, how do we avoid mental health issues that may have emerged for people during the pandemic becoming long term problems that extend beyond its duration? And, you know, we all know there's potentially a mental health crisis coming down the tracks. So and I'm wondering what initiatives you'd like to see put in place to mitigate against that, be they governmental or otherwise? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a big it's a big question and it's a big uncertain question in some ways. I mean, I'll start just um, uh, from the, uh, the perspective of us as individuals. We should do our best where we can to, to um, uh, protect and nurture our own mental health. And also, as we just mentioned, if we do feel there's an issue, don't just keep it private. Talk to a friend in the first instance, contact your GP. He would much rather um, see you and say, no, actually things are okay, rather than not see you when things aren't. Um, so don't be afraid, especially in these times, to reach out for help. I mean, I think the other thing we have to do is, is to plan. I mean, I think the real mental health effects of this pandemic are going to be felt for the next two to five years. Indeed, it may be um, really evident in, over the next year or two what the exact effects are. We do know that there are certain high-risk groups within society, the young and the elderly, uh, COVID survivors we know from previous uh, studies and early studies in China and even studies from previous outbreaks in other parts of the world, people who survive on ventilators, they, they've got remarkably high incidence of symptoms consistent with post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, it's mm. going to be quite long-lasting. The bereaved are a group that I think we need to consider. You know, we know there are over 1,800 deaths um, from COVID to date. And we also know that the, the funeral arrangements for these uh, uh, people will have been very curtailed. And they will, people and their families and friends won't have had a, chance, a proper chance to say goodbye. So I think that's an area that needs looking into. And also, obviously, people with pre-existing current mental health issues who, who may already um, uh, be in difficulties, we need to, to make sure that they're looked after. And that's even before we talk about the effects on the general population. I mean, even without talking about COVID, I mean, we all know this, we say it so often, but it doesn't get translated, that you know, mental health is underfunded. Uh, worldwide, only about 2% of mental health, our health budgets go into mental health. In Ireland, we're a bit better, about 6%, but that's still way behind the European average. And, and this is, you know, this is a set of disorders. And again, these are 
these are um, uh, statistics from the WHO. One in five children and adolescents worldwide have a mental health disorder. Depression alone affects about 264 million people in the population. There are 800,000 suicides every year, one every 40 seconds. Um, people with serious mental health disorders, um, their life expectancy is between 10 and 20 years shorter than a person without a mental health disorder. Um, and you know, the global economy, even just from an economic perspective, the global economy is about $1 trillion a year just from depression and anxiety alone. And yet, if we weren't talking about mental health issues, if this is a physical health disorder we were talking about, and we were throwing about those true statistics, we'd be taking much more action, we'd be investing more in this. And I, I kind of worry when we, we hear all these good words about that we must look after our mental health and all that, but it needs to be translated into more resources, more targeted and wisely spent resources than currently we're doing. I mean, it wasn't really mentioned much in the winter plan, um, you know, and that was disappointing. But um, I think we really need to be planning ahead for the next couple of years and beyond. Uh, and one of the hopeful things about COVID is that there'll be a realisation that we need to invest more in our mental health, not just for COVID times, but in general. Mm. Barbara or Podrick, have you anything that you'd like to add to that part of the discussion? Um, yeah, I mean, I, just to, to come back on something that Paul said, um, one of the groups that I think are uh, amazing are children. I think the children, how the children in this country have dealt with all of this has been brilliant. Uh, and I'm talking about the small kids whose school experience has changed hugely up to the kids in secondary school and particularly the class of 2020 who had so mm. much taken from them and whose college you know whose college experience is radically different and totally not what they ever had envisaged it being and if there was a criticism i would make of gov well there's a million criticisms i would make of government but one of the things that i'd love to see happening is that more praise so often we're especially teenagers being blamed for gathering or being blamed because somebody took a photo, you know, somewhere and there was a load of them all together. I honestly think that the vast majority of them deserve a huge praise. And I would really love to see that being done on a national basis, that we would be constantly encouraging our children to, to keep going, but also that we really do appreciate how that they have um they have taken all this on the chin, if they like, and that they are dealing with it. The other thing that um I think which is kind of related is social media. Um, and social media gets a really bad rap, rightly so a lot of the time. It can be a place of awful, you know, kind of hatred and vindictive and abuse and, you know, just nonsense. But also social media does provide a lot of people with a connection that perhaps they wouldn't have normally. Um, and I have been on social media forever and I've always found that it is as you have created. In other words, if you're careful about who you follow and who you engage with, it can be a way for people who are living on their own, who've also found all of this, and not just elderly people, but anybody who's living on their own and working from home is very, very isolated. And social media can provide that level of, of, uh, of interaction with other people. It also can provide people with a space to say, which again, I think is really important from a mental health perspective, is that, I'm not having a good day today. This day, like I've now, to, today it's all come in on top of me and I just want to go back to bed. I had one of those days last week and I tweeted, I really want to go back to bed and just not get up and deal with this day because I've had it, I'm done, I'm tired. And, I'm, and I mean, just to hear the people saying, yeah, I know, yeah, you know, we're all fed up. It just made you feel a bit more that you weren't kind of abnormal in some way because you weren't kind of taken one for the team and you were kind of resigning from the team and going you know what I've had enough this team play I'm out for a while <laughs> so you know I do think that uh, and obviously elderly people I think are quite and I'm sure there's a lot of elderly people my father-in-law lives in the UK um, and he's had a crash course in, in learning WhatsApp and uh, being able to do video calling and being able to do group chats and all the rest of it so you know mm. I think those those kind of things are, are important. Mm. Podrick, I'm just as as uh, Barbara touched on it there around the idea that we can reach out to each other and be comforted by the fact that there are other people in the same boat as us that nobody's kind of sailing through this thing unaffected. You know, stigma around mental health issues is something that we all have a role in challenging. And I wonder, could you maybe tell us a wee bit about how stigma emerges and if you think that I don't know, the global nature of this experience has the capacity to help reduce stigma around mental health difficulties. As the sun shines directly on my face and makes me practically <laughs> invisible, so I might just hit it. 
Um, I, I go back to what, what Barbara said there. I, I would I would hazard a guess that there hasn't been somebody who hasn't experienced a day like what Barbara just described there over the last six months. Uh, like I had one yesterday. It was just this is too much. There's too much uncertainty. This I, I, I don't want to talk for, for an hour and just turned off my phone and said I'm not not dealing with it. And this collective experience, I think, has helped us understand and empathize with people who experience these behavioral and emotional responses that have occurred over the last six months. That that feeling of worry and anxiety, that feeling of being low and fed up, that, that feeling of having to wash our hands repeatedly in order to stave away something, that it is that this, I, I think this collective experience that we have all been in together at least gives us some insight into how some people feel regularly all of the time. And not only that, but em I suppose that empathy that we can, that we have felt and shared those, those kinds of experiences, we also get to see how others have responded to us when we need that help mm -hmm. and what has worked and what doesn't work. And we start to empathize with the, the supports that we get from our friends and from our family to understand, well, actually now I've experienced those, that low mood, that anxiety, that, that, that level of, of internal distress. Um, but now I've noticed that when other people aren't stigmatizing, when they're being supportive, when they're sharing that experience with me, when they're saying, actually, you know what, I feel the same, when people are, are, are collectively sharing in that, that group experience, I think that is a huge role to play in reducing that stigma. Barbara, what do you think? Do you think people have gained some insights into how easily our well-being can maybe, mental well-being can be shaken in a way that they maybe thought they were immune to before? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I do. And I also think that it has woken an awful lot of us up to the kind of things that we've always taken for granted, such as having reasonably healthy mental health um, mm -hmm. can be shaken so uh, re reasonably quickly, well, very quickly and reasonably easy, you know, that our good mental health can often, in my view, not being an expert, predicated on a whole load of things happening or a whole load of things being in place and suddenly all those things are taken away and that's very challenging to have to deal with um and uh, you know it, it, again trying to, to look trying to spin that around into a positive I mean uh I, for years and I've I have uh, toyed with with meditation and all kinds of other ways of developing a kind of an inner calm um and have tried to live in the moment as uh, for years, and I've never managed it. My mind is constantly going ahead. I love planning. I love making, and suddenly I'm forced to live in the moment because you can't plan for anything. There's no point in worrying about what's going to happen tomorrow because it's out of your hands, and you really don't know. And as poor Rick said, you know, or or uh, maybe it was Paul. All we have to do is, you know, is all we can do is keep washing our hands and keep socially distancing and keep having a, a mask when you go into the shops and that's all we can do. Um, so we really are being kind of forced into living with it, living in the moment. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, you know, that's something that's, uh, that's, that's also quite new. And also for somebody like me, who is a control freak, who likes to control everything, you suddenly realize, you know, for years again, all the self-help stuff that I read was like, you should learn to go with the flow. And I was like, yeah, yeah, as long as the flow is going in my direction, you know, the way I want it to go, that's grand. Uh, but now you suddenly have to kind of learn to go with the flow because you don't really have, you don't really have a choice. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that even for those of us who would consider their mental health to be reasonably um, okay most of the time, We've learned other big lessons that um, um, because we've had to, and I think that's that's uh, that's important. Paul, do you think that there could be a lasting impact on stigma levels as a result of this around stigma around mental health issues? I mean, I really hope so. I, I hope that kind of universal experience that, by definition, all of us are experiencing at the moment will lead to a greater understanding. I mean, tackling stigma is is complex, um, and um, uh, so I'd be. Uh, I'd be optimistic and hopeful. Good. Podrick, this is the bit where we're going to try and predict the unpredictable. I'm wondering, can you do a little sort of crystal ball gazing for us? And, you know, as the pandemic evolves, have you a sense of what the future challenges might be for us in terms of continuing to live with the virus, managing our response as a community? And is there any kind of way that 
we can prepare ourselves for that or are we sort of reliant on things beyond ourselves? You're asking me to be Mullingar's answer to Mystic Meg here, which is, uh, yeah. That's exactly what I'm doing. As Paul said, this is a very, very unpredictable time. Um, looking into the future, I think we have moved from a very, I suppose, clear, uh, crystal clear goal to one where there are so many different competing demands on, on society as a whole that now we're having to consider the economic impact, the social impact, the health impact, the mental health impact. And we can see that there is, uh, that that initial cohesion is, is, is being challenged right now. And I think that going into the future, like we said, it, it is so unpredictable, but we know that three C's will help us uh, to, to get some of that back. And that's the clarity of messaging that we are hearing. We're actually really good at responding when there is a plan. And that has been demonstrated through lots of the research that we have found initially during this pandemic is that when there is clarity of messaging, we actually yeah. can draw more resilience for ourselves through that. And grit had been used our, our own individual and collective grit had been used at the very start of this pandemic when we thought maybe this is like the snow days, as Barbara had said. <laughs> and then as, as those that two weeks turned into four weeks, turned into six weeks, we still managed to dig in to hold firm as, as the, the term was used. But that clarity of messaging, that consistency of implementation. And the second C being consistency of implementation is really, really important. And you'll notice that that the, if the, the rules are laid down and we start to spot, can you see me? Yeah. Yeah, the, you just froze mm -hmm. momentarily. Because right. you were communing with the future. That's all that happened. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that consistency of implementation also was challenged during that fallow period in the summer where we had, where we start to see fairness playing a, a really big role here. That where we found that we were following certain guidelines that were laid down and others weren't. And particularly those who we saw in the public eye not following those that really chipped away at that collective cohesion. And that's the final thing is that there is some level of social cohesion built in. And Barbara's point is really, really important. That some way of recognizing us following the guidance that is given by recognizing the, the sacrifices that we have been made is a much, much more effective way of, of, of getting buy-in, of changing behavior and helping us to, to maintain that grit throughout the winter, then finding ways to point out at people who have not been following the rules, who have been breaking, uh, you know, I suppose, uh, the, the guidance that has been given. The recognizing and catching each other doing it right by by celebrating that by building having very very clear messaging a clear plan uh consistency of that implementation is going to be crucial over the next while and i think that that will help us build social cohesion when we actually catch each other doing it right and recognize the sacrifices that we're all making at this point in time mm. okay. that certainly all sounds quite positive reinforcement which i think works for all of us from toddlers all the way through to adults it's good uh we've covered an awful lot across the chat and I'm sure all of us would like to end on a kind of a hopeful note so I was just wondering as we discussed you know the lack of predictability the uncertainty is is a source of anxiety for people at the moment and sometimes if you go down that rabbit hole you can sort of lose sight of what some of the constants are what some of the really reassuring elements and aspects of our life are so I was just wondering if I could ask each of you to maybe remind us of some of the things that are predictable, predictable or constant in our lives that help you to sort of deal with that anxiety. I might start with you, Paul. Sure, um, thanks, Sarah. I, I suppose there are two things for me, uh, sort of bro broad areas. One is, um, as our social contexts and all that have, have had to reduce and all that, the quality rather than the quantity of things has been important of our experiences. And I've tried to concentrate on the quality of the time and um, the, the quality of the relationships that I have. And it's been, it's been really rewarding. And I suppose the other thing is to really acknowledge and really appreciate simplicity. And, and as Barbara said earlier, nature. I remember the early days of the pandemic, I was having days of two halves. I'd been at work um, really busy with quite interesting stuff, as you can imagine. And then you go out into these almost empty streets. And I, I was actually stopping and time had almost stood still, but in a really nice way, you stopped to look at a flower that was blooming or whatever, stuff that I would not have tended to do before. I still remember those magical moments. I'm not trying to undermine how tough it was for everybody. Mm -hmm. but 
probably had moments there that they'd like to hold on to and bring forward even after the pandemic is over. Um, and uh, there's, there's an awful lot to appreciate and, and to hold on to stuff that doesn't change, you know, in fact. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Barbara? Yeah, I mean, again, another one of the things that has uh, happened uh, in a kind of a welcome way is that I think communities, you know, living in the city or living in the suburbs, you know, you do have this feeling that, oh, if you live down the country, the sense of community would be a lot greater. And particularly when people are generally out at work all day, people are now in their own communities an awful lot more. And so I think we're value valuing our communities and that works in a neighborly way. Like our neighborhood here, our estate set up a WhatsApp group at the beginning of this. And although my heart kind of went, oh, mother of God, it's actually been an amazing resource, you know, because initially it was set up to help kind of if there was elderly people or people who needed shopping done and all that kind of stuff, which was great. But it then has turned into this um, like a forum where I have an old bike that I don't need anymore. Does anybody need an old bike? I have some kids toys I don't need. Here's a pile of books that I finished with. But there's a real sense of us now as a community. And I think that's very good. I think the other thing that I would say to people, particularly coming into the winter, is that it's OK to pair everything back to what you can manage. So I think, again, speaking particularly for women, women in the home, an awful lot of women who are in the home are actually snow, are never have never been as busy because they've bloody adults all over the place where normally they wouldn't have had. So, you know, um, and all of these adults are looking to be fed twice a day uh, or three times a day. <laughs> and a lot of women have taken this on. So I'd say to the women, first of all, you don't need to do that. If they're adults, you're not running a cafe. Don't, you know, let them all look after themselves and don't get stressed out about that. And number two, it's OK to pair everything back. You know, I mean, a lot, you know, I... Um, Christmas to me is always a kind of a bittersweet time, but normally we get the, the Australians home. They're not going to be home this year. I'm going to pair Christmas right back to what I can manage to make it like Christmas, but not exactly Christmas. I love Halloween, which is coming up in a couple of weeks time. And again, I know from our neighborhood WhatsApp group that I think most parents are not happy about kids calling to the door anymore to be given sweets, which although I have no children in the house, I loved that whole thing. I used to dress up as a witch every Halloween and I answer the door. Um, so that's not going to happen. But apparently now they're arranging for the kids to do a parade down the street and we'll oh, all sit in our, in our houses and kind of clap them and watch them. So there, there are, we can do things differently that are a little bit the same, but different. And, you know, maybe there will be lessons in all of that that we can take away. And the other thing that I'm always saying to my own girls here and to other kids that I meet, particularly, as I say, the class of 2020 is for all. And I'm not trying to minimize the, the awfulness of a lot of this for a lot of people is. But this is a historical time. This is a time that will be written about in history books. So, you know, the class of 2020, you will be remembered as the class who were messed up in all kinds of ways. And the fact that you survive it. Well, you'll be treated almost like war heroes. I don't know if they will or not, but telling them that helps, I think. Um, so I think that all of that is really important. <laughs> well, they'll certainly be the people in years to come that will be, their grandkids will be going, what was it like at the pandemic? Exactly. Going, yeah, oh. tell me about the 2020 <laughs> pandemic. Exactly. Podrick, what about you? What are the things that you're sort of, the constants that are giving you sucker? Yeah, um, I, I like, I, I find that uh, routine is, is grounding um, and particularly where we, we can find ourselves in a bit of a behaviour vacuum, that those things that we had to look forward to have been removed. And, and I think that in the absence of, of those, you know, those collective experiences that we all look forward to, like I mentioned to you about the barber, the gigs, the weddings, the holidays, the Christmas, the trick or treating. Sorry, sorry, Barbara, I can see your face. I'll stop. But, <laughs> but within that, Paul mentioned a really good point around noticing, around mm. just taking the time to notice things that have always been present, but we haven't had the opportunity or time to notice. And I really enjoy that. And I love that idea that we notice things that we haven't noticed before and take those, mo those mindful moments for ourselves. Um, I'm, I'm very fortunate to live close to the sea so I can look at the tides and build my day around the tides coming in or the tides going out, the wildlife that is there, the jellyfish have gone finally, which is great. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but you start to see this change in nature. I also mentioned yeah. to you earlier on that the equinox and the solstice hold this point for me. Now, I'm not dressing up like a witch around these times, Barbara, but I am still really looking at, at the sunrise and sunset and, and, and planning adequately around that. I'm always a summer bunny, but even now in the winter, I'm saying, okay, 
what are the things that we can do to cozy this place up and actually embrace those darker evenings as they come in? And that takes a little bit of planning that is there. The final thing that I, I, I have done and I recommend to people is to find ritual. Find some sort of ritual that you have for yourself. Those moments, we, when we think about our normal workday, when we are going into a particular place of work, there is a huge amount of ritual that goes into that. And like it or, or lump it, the commute is actually often a point where we have time to ourselves, where we have time in a car, time on public transport, or time on a bike, where you have that buffer between work and home. And that ritual of unwinding of, as Paul said, grounding yourself as you move from one headspace to another is actually reflected in music, moving from one physical space to another. So building in that ritual and routine to signal I am starting my workday and now I am finished it and that I am going to use, have a buffer of 20 to 30 minutes, whatever that routine is, that you are building it in that works for you, that helps you to unwind as you move into that really good part, the meaningful part of your day where you are with your loved ones or where you are having time to yourself. Porik, you wanted Porik, to mention something. Yeah, oh. Porik, can I, can I suggest that you actually are a witch? I mean, you've mentioned <laughs> ritual, equinox, solstice, watching the tides. You are so a witch, man. You should yeah. embrace <laughs> that. <laughs> you know, Mulligar is the home of the Hill of Ishnok as well, Barbara. <laughs> so you, you there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that unexpected note, <laughs> we'll, we'll wrap it up for today, but I just want to say thank you to Professor Paul Fearon, to Barbara Scully, to Podrick Walsh. If you know anybody that you think might have enjoyed this and missed it, they can catch it up. It's been recorded. It'll be on the Walk In My Shoes website. And there's a whole host of other events that you can access online for the rest of the week. Go to walkinmyshoes.ie to find out more. But for the moment, from the four of us, thanks for your time and take care. Thank you. Bye.